Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Joss, the curator of the online exhibition entitled Being In Between, In Between Being, which includes a virtual event series and a catalog. Tonight is the final night of both the series and the exhibition. So it's so great to have you here to close out this month long e party we've been having. And I'm especially grateful to have Gabrielle Seville here tonight to help us do so. Being in between, in between being showcases intermedia works by queer and women artists exploring aspects of identity related to in betweenness. This concept is considered both in the context of medium and textuality but also in terms of embodiment and ways of knowing or understanding. This virtual collection in particular is concerned with individual and collective techniques that assist in addressing the interwoven modes of oppression and address that can include resistance alongside rest, examination and creation, quiet dreams amidst bold celebrations. All exhibition artworks, event recordings and catalog can be found at SUNY Buffalo's Lower Art Gallery website. And I'm gonna send that in the chat right now just so you have it at your convenience. All right, for partnership and support, I thank the UB Department of Art and the James H. McNulty Chair of English. Without either, this exhibition and event series would not have been possible. I am thrilled to now begin introducing Gabrielle Seville. I have been an enormous fan of her work ever <laughs> since I came across her first book, Swallow the Fish, a memoir in performance art which was named by Entropy, a best nonfiction book of 2017. I began working with this text around then, discovered the 2014 performance recording of Fugue da Montreal, and then eventually started presenting some research when paths crossed, stars aligned, and a previous student of hers was the organizer of a conference panel I was participating in. This awesome student went to put Gabrielle and I in touch which led to discovering shared feminist art idols, fueling other projects, and for me, maintaining so much reverence for and support of her work. When beginning to pitch Being In Between, In Between Being exhibition, I knew a performance by Gabrielle needed to be a part of it, and it's been such an honor to see her work in conversation with the other artists. As she explains, the aim of her work is to open up space, I think we can all see how the dynamic and invigorating qualities of her fugue performance enhance the exhibition's exploration of in-betweenness inimitably. <laughs> Gabrielle Seville is a Black performance artist originally from Detroit, Michigan. She has premiered mm -hmm. 50 original solo and collaborative performance works around the world. Since May 2014, she has been performing Say My Name, an action for 270 abducted Nigerian girls as an act of embodied remembering. Her art writing has appeared in The Third Rail, Art 21, Small Acts, and Obsidian. Her second book, Experiments in Joy, engages race, performance, and collaboration. And her chapbook of performance writing, entitled Ghost Gestures, was selected by Banu Kapil for the Nonfiction Prize in 2019 by Goldline Press, which will come out later this year. And then her next book, The Deja Vu, thinks about Black dreams and Black time, and is due to come out February 22nd, 2022. Right. She, <laughs> she currently teaches in the MFA program in creative writing and the BFA program in critical studies at the California Institute of the Arts. Please join me in warmly welcoming Gabrielle Seville. Thank you all so much. And just thank you so much for this to be here. I see a beautiful student. I'm so excited. I see a colleague and fellow writer. I see another incredible artist who I had an opportunity to, to witness and um, hear in an artist talk from the exhibit. And I also see some people I don't know. So it's like a perfect audience, people of all kinds of connections. Um, to begin, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I am, my feet right now are here on the land stewarded by the Tongva people here in Southern California. And I wanna thank them for continuing to steward this land and for allowing me to be a guest here. I wanna thank my own ancestors who really, whew, I mean, a wonderful mentor of mine, Sharon Bridgeforth always says that we are the dreams of our ancestors come true. And I really feel the manifestation of my own ancestors and the work that I'm doing. And I'm really calling on them for what I wanna talk about with you today. Um, really this exhibition has been 
amazing just to kind of witness how Jocelyn has shifted from one whole kind of concept, IRL, into this other sort of virtual concept. And so again, I just want to lift up the work that you've done and also say like, well, if you're going to name something, you know, in between being, being in between, that means that you're going to fall into some shift for most likely, like I think you called it. And, and part of that falling into the shift is what I want to talk about today. Like what happens when we're shifting from one kind of mode to another, or what are the different kinds of modes that we can shift from and into if we consider that relative to ancestry, heritage, diaspora, genre, making, all of these aspects, what do we understand relative to those shifts? And then how do we respond to that shiftedness? So thank you again so much. And I'm gonna really look at the time because I'm notoriously over planning and have too much to share. So let's get it cooking here. Screen share, okay. So here we go. And it was sort of amazing and awesome when I got to see on that website, there's my little feet, there's this dirt, there's this, there's, there's this cord, which we'll talk about. And here we are in January, 2021, and the very last day of being in between, in between being. The title of this talk is Seances, and it's gonna be relatively informal in the sense that I wanna just share with you some images and ideas that are drawn from my own performance practice and also inspired by some other work by artists that I love. Another thing though, that is huge, huge, huge for the specific work that was included in this exhibition, which was documentation of my 2014 performance Fugue Down Montreal, is this event, which was so cataclysmic to members of the Haitian diaspora. And that was the earthquake, the 7.0 earthquake that took place in Haiti really almost exactly 11 years ago, 11 years ago in three days, January 12, 2010. And so the weight of that commemoration is also still very much a part of what I'm feeling as I talk to you a little bit about this idea of the seance. Okay, so if I say seances, what does that word evoke for you? And you can drop it that in the chat or you can say it, you can unmute yourself and just say it. But like, what does the word seance mean to you? Conjuring, spirit, yes, yes. Ritual, visitation, fabulous. Communication with the beyond, calling. Wow, you all are like geniuses. The other realm, perfect. Well, if we go to something very um, denotative, <laughs> like the Oxford English Dictionary, we get these kinds of definitions, that a seance is a setting, a sitting, a spiritualist meeting to receive spirit communications, a meeting at which people attempt to make contact with the dead, especially through the agency of a medium, you can really understand how as a performance artist or how any kind of artist could be compelled or interested in this kind of definition, this idea of an attempt to make contact with the dead, especially through the agency of a medium. And we can think of the medium as a person, we can think of mediums as people, but also a medium as an artistic form or genre as well. Here you see me, those of you who had an opportunity to watch that documentation of Fugue Down Montreal, you see this is a still, uh, actually it's not a still, it's a photograph. I think this one might actually be a photograph uh, from that performance. And you can just really see through that image of me pressing this extension cord. This is like a one, 100 foot extension cord, pressing this into my heart, trying to make some connection with bloodline, thinking about that as a meeting or an attempt, an attempt to make contact with the dead. And we see this dirt here as a kind of evocation also of the dead. And also I'm interruptible. You can drop something in the chat. You can unmute yourself if you have a question or if something is striking you, just let me know. We're intimate here. 
we move forward then from the kind of dictionary definition into the way that this word animates my own Black feminist performance practice. Here are some other possible ways for us to think about the word seance. Seance as a ritual, a ritual performance, a ceremony, a ritual ceremony, an invocation, an invitation of spirit, an act of spirit work, a manifestation of this phrase that Jocelyn has put together, being in between, in between being. Let's take a minute with that. If you're thinking about these sort of liminal spaces, these intertextual or combined blurred spaces, a seance, you can think of this as an interface between this realm and another realm, a conjuring or an attempt to make contact with this other space, but in the happening of the conjuring, in the happening of the making contact, you become a manifestation of being in between or in between being. At the same time, especially when we remember this anniversary of this terrible cataclysmic thing that happened, we can also think about a seance as a negotiation of grief. If we're calling on those from another realm, there's some desire, there's some, some loss there that there's, that there's an attempt to reclaim. Similarly, we can talk about an activation of bloodlines. So, I mean, part of what I love to do when I talk about my own work is just actually share work by people who I love, <laughs> whose work really inspired and informed me and whose work I'm aspiring towards trying to get to on some level, but also thinking about what happens when we look at some fairly recognizable works of performance art in this framework of the seance. What happens when we do that? Okay. So think about this. Here's someone who's super influential for me. Um, this is an African-American performance artist named Adrienne Piper. This is a really early work of hers as she was negotiating her own body and the relationship between subject and object. And what does it mean? Like, what is the state of being in between or in between being relative to subject and object? What does it mean to be a self? What does it mean to have a self and be in the world? How does the flesh relate to material or landscape? And also if we think about this body, wet paint, like this sign, a person with a sign of wet paint, sort of like, well, what is the edifice of her body? Or in what ways has she been objectified? Or what, what are the layers or striations of existence or non-existence that she's playing with? Now, another performance with a sign. Here's an artist I love, Dred Scott, who's known for historical reenactments. If you were to look at images from the sanitation strike in Memphis, right at the end of Dr. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, he was trying to help with that sanitation strike. And they had these signs that said, I am a man. What happens now when we have Dred Scott in the 20th century, I don't think this is a 21st century image, but in the 20th century, late 20th century, still maybe 30, 40 years after those 60s images, recreating that, so calling in those who are absent, but then adding the presence of this contradiction, I am not a man. So there's something that's happening there with absence and presence that's very interesting to me. There's a conjuring of those who were there, but also a, a, a denunciation of them at the same time or a denunciation of a world that refused, that refused to see their manhood and also maybe is refusing to see his. Here's a piece I like adore, and this is a very controversial piece for some members of my community, uh, my, my various communities. This is Nona Faustin, the photographer. This is a part of her white shoe series. Some of you may know this work. And this is the, is the artist herself. She identifies as a photographer, I believe, but I really see her also as a performance artist in part because she's activating and embodying her own presence and also channeling all these, these works, I would say, are interested in some process of channeling those who came before. Here she is in Wall Street on this box 
which evokes for me at least the specter of slavery. We've got those white shoes, which evokes the sort of image of innocence. They're pumps. So there's something there also about femininity or some aspiration towards a certain kind of femininity. And this title, From Her Body Sprang the Greatest Wealth. What happens when we think about an image like this, an action like this as a, as a kind of seance, a negotiation of grief, an activation of bloodline, a channeling of spirit. Here's another artist who is really wonderful. And I know that Joss is working with her as well. I think about Anna Mendieta and again, presence and absence of the body. What, how do we recognize the elemental qualities of our own embodiment, our relationship to nature, sight, place? And then also, what can we do with absence? What do we do? How do we trace what has been left behind? Or how do we acknowledge the presence of an absence? How can that be a kind of ritual performance, an activation of spirit, a manifestation of spirit work, a seance? I just love this red, it's so beautiful in this image. Ah, oh, it just knocks me out. Finally, I'm interested in this image as a person of African-American and Haitian descent because there's something here around like diaspora actually, which is a word I'm gonna talk about significantly in a moment and the specter of kind of a misunderstood or dissipated diaspora. So in this work, which was originally conceived in 1992. Um, I think it was like the last two members of the undiscovered tribe of the, you know, the, the Guatanawi people, whatever it was that they originally entitled the piece is more commonly called Couple in a Cage. I mean, you have Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Peña in this cage, right? Pretending to be these indigenous people and quite notoriously in various institutions, the audience didn't get the joke. It was supposed to be a big satire and they believed that it was true. So there's something interesting to me about displacement. There's, there's been a lot of writing about this work relative to institutional kind of trust or mistrust and framing, but there's also something here for me around what it means to be a member of a diaspora, what it means to be a migrant or an immigrant in a different place versus what it means to be, or not even necessarily versus, but in relation to or right next to, what does it mean to be a tourist? And at what point, in fact, in the diaspora experience, as you're trying to retrace your own bloodline, do you start to feel like a tourist? And what are the different kinds of processes or rituals or performances or engagements that can happen that can somehow engage that state of in-betweenness or being in between or or what is the guilt that emerges from that what is the kind of um humor that that unexpected humor or satire that rises from that um how do we understand site location belonging relationship and then what is the spirit work that we need to do to negotiate these various locations So in Haitian Creole, there's this word diaspora, which if you um, watch Few de Montreal, you hear me say that at a kind of a key moment, diaspora. And that is the name of both the extended network of dispersed people of Haitian descent, but it is also, you can actually call an individual person a diaspora. Like that's also the name of a kind of person. And I think before I get into the Fugue Trilogy, I wanna acknowledge, I mean, I've made a lot of different kinds of actions. Some works have lasted for like a minute or two. Some have lasted for hours and hours and hours. I've made stuff oh, in galleries and on the street in art museums in theaters. I mean, just a lot of classrooms, a lot of different kinds of work, but throughout from the very beginning, part of my practice has been engaged with negotiating this part of my identity and location this aspect of being a diaspora. So you can see, as, we, as I show you some images, some questions that I'm negotiating in this work include, where do I belong? Who can I channel? Which spirits can I invoke? 
which bloodlines can resurface? So these are some key questions for me. And I would, I would suggest that these are kind of interesting questions if you look back at those images by the other artists, or even if you're engaging with artists in critique or conversation. And whether it's live art action or even, um, I think the medium can be writing. So I know like Julia here, Julia Science is, is a writer. And so thinking about like those questions relative to writing as well. The very first ever kind of grant I received first commission from the Jerome Foundation in Minneapolis to make performance was in 2002, it was so long ago. It was called Whisper the Index of Sons and it was all about Haitian family secrets and the process of translating a poet named Jacqueline Bourget Rosier. And that is like my white whale, that translation I have worked on for over like 20 years and still only pieces of it have been published and it's been like a whole big mess. But anyway, this performance was something that came out of that and it was very much about my Haitian identity. This was a work that was made through the National Endowment of the Humanities in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico called Anacaona about the indigenous queen of what was once Haiti um, and the Dominican Republic. And I sort of recreated her overthrow. <laughs> and there's writing about this that's, that's gonna be in ghost gestures, which is coming out if you wanna know a little bit more about that whole situation. Um, it, was quite, it was quite something what happened. I kind of lost control. It was my first time as a, in, a, in a performance where I like literally lost control of the audience. So that was great. Um, but the notion of diaspora, as much as it's very specific in a Haitian context, for me, it's also about this larger, kind of African diaspora, Black diaspora experience as well. That's both because the Haitian diaspora is still has this root in a larger African cultural, Af, you know, like African diasporic cultural context. And even in African, in Haitian culture, there's a lot about like, you know, Benin and Guinea and, and this is where we're from, et cetera, et cetera. So there's still a great awareness of that, but also because I'm a bicultural person. And so I have one parent from Haiti and another who's African-American. And so it's not even just a step away or a kind of Haiti and then a larger kind of African relationship, but this question of like African-American um, presence and absence, not knowing displacement and trying to reach back and understand something about um, just, the larger shifts of the middle passage and before, um, like what happened in that moment, I guess before, and then in this case, this would be after, this is a piece that I made in 2006. And so this, this would be like, if we were in real life and you know, Jocelyn invited me to give a talk and then two minutes into it, I just took off my clothes and stood up and <laughs> said, step right up and turned around and then had everyone reckon with the reality of my body in space. Um, and this is a piece that I've also redone. I remember I actually did this work at the place where I worked before I worked there. I probably <laughs> wouldn't do it now, but it was great. I was invited to do a, um, a class visit and I was like, you know what? I think I want to do this piece for everyone. And then really to reckon with the reality of the black femme body, really reckon with that and not just the story about it or the theory of it, but really have that body be in the space and to consider Am I ashamed? Are you? Are you? Are you afraid for me? Why? I mean, it just it was a lot about power and affect, and to me, it was also something that was hearkening to the encounter, that encounter of displaced African people in Europe, in the United States, around the world. So that so that that was an early piece, the first piece that I made in Africa, and this idea of like, well, how do you return to a place where you've never been? well, you must be a ghost. So I created a ritual around the kind of ghostliness of African-American experience. And this is sort of how I looked at the end of the ritual when I activated things with flour and water and these cash, cash register rolls, paper, African braid hair, stone, chalk. I mean, there was a whole set of things that happened. And actually in ghost gestures, there's a lot of writing about this piece as well. Just a couple more before we get into Fugue. Um, Say My Name, uh, an action for 270 abducted Nigerian girls. This is a work that I still do, although I do it somewhat less now as a work of embodied remembering. It's a work that's really important to me and I wanna make sure that it doesn't turn into like a gimmick 
that, and that's something that I think about. Most works that I do, I don't repeat, but this is one that I have repeated at least a dozen times because it was so intense and astonishing for me, the idea that these Chibok girls, you know, could just be abducted and that we didn't necessarily at the beginning know their names. We didn't know what to do with them. And I just was interested to understand like, well, what could we do? So I called roll. They were on their way to take an exam. And you can see that there's a stack of paper, like white sheets of paper. And on every sheet of paper is the name of a girl, if I could find it, or it would just say the girl who was snatched, the girl who was snatched. And I would call roll and then let the paper drop to the floor. And the instructions to the audience before I began was do whatever you feel moved to do. And it, this was a timed activity. And you can see that at least in this image, there were some people who were very unnerved by those pages hitting the floor and they came and they picked them up. But in different iterations, a lot of different things have happened. Again, this is really situated in my um, location as a black diaspora person, as a diaspora, as someone who is trying to reckon with a certain kind of grief that feels both like something that belongs to me and also something that I have no right to. You know, like I'm not a Chibok person, I'm not a citizen of Nigeria. Um, I, I really, so the idea that I would have a claim to this is shaky and yet I felt that claim so intensely. And so that's part of the in-betweenness, being in between, in between being that I feel like some of my work activates. And this particular piece for sure, I think, could be, could be categorized as a seance. Um, one last image, just thinking about presence and absence and trying to identify like who is sitting with us, who is with us, how can we access that? What are we carrying? What do we have over us? What do we have below us? Those are also really important questions that I think were a part of Fugue as well. Yeah, undiscovered Amerindians. Okay, I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything than anybody. Y'all with me? You feeling okay? Hanging in there? Okay. So, I mean, a question I think that is important for me, especially in the wake of this catastrophic earthquake from 2010. And I mean, I think pandemic time has also really affirmed that time is both fast and slow. And that even though that earthquake was 11 years ago, in some ways it was like yesterday, right? Um, some, some days it feels like it was a million years ago because of so many other things that have happened. And then other days it feels like, wow, that really just happened. And so thinking about being a survivor, like being a witness or being someone who was not taken from that event, a question has raised for me, like what might the last one standing try to say to the ones who passed before? So if those have gone before you and you're trying to reach to them, you're trying to channel them, but maybe you're also trying to communicate or you're trying to listen and hear, like what exactly is the nature of that exchange? And that's another part of the question. That's another part of the, the inquiry, I guess I would say, that I'm attempting to do in the Fugue trilogy. I mean, just look at the devastation of this. I mean, these were people's homes. These were businesses, these were marketplaces and so much of this even now has not been rebuilt. Okay, so you can see like I'm an English teacher. So just before we look at a bunch of images, let's, let me just get into what this word fugue is because I'm interested in the two different um, definitions of this word. We've got the musical definition, a contrapuntal composition in which a short melody or phrase is introduced by one part and then successively taken up by others. So you hear that melody come in by other instruments or other voices, and then it gets developed into by interweaving the parts, which to me is sort of a beautiful other way of thinking about what a diaspora is, maybe. And then this, this definition in psychiatry, in psychiatry, fugue, a state or period of loss of awareness of one's identity, often coupled with flight from one's usual environment. So again, another possible definition of diaspora or diaspora. The first fugue happened um, really in relation to the first anniversary of the 2010 earthquake. It happened in the Five Miles Gallery in Brooklyn by invitation of Haiti Culture Exchange. 
And I was really um, so speechless. Sometimes I'm chat, like right now I'm chatty. Uh, and sometimes in performance I'm chatty, but in fugue, I don't, I mean, it's a lot more about movement, gesture, concept, image, action. And I worked with 500 pounds of dirt, a shovel and four suitcases. I do wanna show you in this image, there's a moment when I'm lying, like I've parted, there's a whole ritual that I create in terms of bringing in the suitcases, opening them up, smelling them, sometimes things drop out of them, uh, parting the dirt open. And then I lay there for a moment with this shovel and there's a video that plays. It's very short and I wanna, I wanna just show you this video. We tested this, so now let us see, Jess, if this is still going to work for us. And let's see if it will. No, hold on. So that's what happens when you test things. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, is this really gonna work for us? Wow, I don't know what just happened there. I'm gonna try one, aha, okay, yeah. Zoom is keeping me on my toes, but it will not thwart me. It will not thwart me. Okay, great, I think I found it. Yes, I did. Okay, you still, do you see it? Yes, you do. Okay, so let's just make this nice and big and let's play it. Awesome. I just wanted to show you that in terms of a kind of, um, I called it the dirt reverie and thinking about like, what do we carry? What is the landscape that we carry? What happens when the earthquakes or moves? And then is there a way to actually change time and bring it back? So that was another element. Um, there was a combination of sort of live art action with that projected space. And then thinking also about installation and the way that all of these things got composed in the space, my body's at rest, you have this projected image and then it returns. So I wanted to just show you that. Let me go back to these slides right quick. Cool. Yes, here we go. All right, back to business here. So this was the first fugue in 2011 and then as I mentioned before, I've, I've just always been interested in kind of connecting local loss or local grief to this larger diaspora loss, diaspora grief. And thinking now about the Middle Passage, I had this opportunity to present at the Yari Yari um, Organization of Women Writers of Africa conference that was taking place in Accra, Ghana. And there actually you see Rosamond S. King, who's a wonderful poet and performance artist, um, and we've often shared spaces and had progressive um, sort of performance sequences. And so she had finished her piece crossings and, and kind of had moved people through a space and got the audience to where I was. And I was right on the beach in Accra. And then this performance happened. And so if in the first fugue I was working with a shovel and four suitcases and dirt. Here, the shovel became a mirror, <clears throat> excuse me, and the suitcases became these cash register rolls, these rolls of white paper, which was another 
uh, material that I worked with in, in um, the Gambia in ghost gestures some years before. And again, I mean, it's sort of about trying to trace or retrace pathways in this sense, using this, these cash register roles that became about these commercial pathways and how they got kind of tangled into my body and shifted. This is also braid hair. I mean, so this is again, carrying some of the associations as an African-American person that I have with quote unquote Africa, which is like this big morass, huge, big concept that's just generated in, in fact through the Middle Passage. And, and so a big association that I had was getting my hair braided and buying this, this braid hair, which, you know, is like not made in Africa. And, you know, it's just, a, it's a really interesting thing. So thinking about commerce and bringing that into the installation. And so creating a ritual with all of these different elements and then taking them all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. and releasing them there. The last fugue, the one that was a part of this um, wonderful exhibition, then extends sort of, we started just with this Haitian tragedy, we went out into the Middle Passage and now we're thinking about, I was thinking about extended bloodlines, immigration, migrant experience and, and especially this idea of bloodline, instead of the cash register rolls, now all of a sudden we have this extension cord, it's a power line, it's long, it's red. And at the center now we have this shell, which is something that's natural, but it's also, I mean, I think about like a tourist relic, it's a souvenir, it's something that's displaced. Um, it's also something that can make sound as an instrument. So I was interested in the interplay between these um, materials. And I should just say that this piece was shown as a part of the Hemispheric Institute's ninth in Quintreau in Montreal in 2014. Uh, again, we had a sequence. Uh, it started off with War Natasha Ogunji's Sweep. And this is an artist, wonderful artist. If you don't know her work, look her up. Then um, Rosamond in this iteration in Montreal did a piece called Sable International, where she was rebuking different um, sort of buildings, memorials, things in the landscape in the center of Montreal that she felt had really, it spoke to the ways that immigrant realities were effaced in the middle of the city. And so she was bringing that back with her body. After me, the wonderful dancer and artist Paloma McGregor um, just sort of watch what we were doing and was like, you know what, I'm gonna do my piece here right now. So then she became a part of the sequence that we did and did an iteration of her work, building a better mount, fish trap after me. And my work came after Rosamond and before Paloma. And so this is, these are some images of me returning to few, sort of tracing the bloodlines, thinking about what it was now to try to synthesize this experience of incredible loss and grief from the, from the earthquake, pondering on the diasporic situation, and then thinking about immigration and how the actual more literal process of me arriving in the United States and how Haitians, they go to Miami, they go to Brooklyn, they go to Montreal, they go to Santo Domingo, they go to, I mean, there are these places in the, in the Virgin Islands. And so just thinking about what is the loss and the drain that's happening there. Here's some rehearsal shots. Or I guess I'm rehearsal shot, that's reductive. I mean, I guess I would really say probably it was more like exploration and play, engagement, inquiry. And then here are some of the images in case you haven't had a chance to see the performance. You see again, Rosamond is leading folks to me. And one thing I should name is that this all happened in the absolute pouring rain. It was not, it, I mean, it had been so sunny every single day, but when we woke up to do that action, boom, the rain was pouring. And so um, that's why you're gonna see people with umbrellas, although I did not have an umbrella, as you can see, but you can really see the rain there and a kind of ritual of extension of the shell into the audience. I'm rooted in that earth. You have this, side, this circling of bloodlines around me, walking the bloodlines. 
moving and taking that extension cord, that bloodline into the shell, placing the shell into this, into this kind of altar space that we created with the park bench, by the way. Harnessing the bloodlines. Trying to find that beating heart. And then really returning to a very iconic Haitian image of the carrying, sort of the carrying of something on your head. And here it's this whole image of, I don't know, modernity, representation, the future technology, progress, but also a kind of obsolete notion of progress with this old television set. And thinking about like what representations I'm carrying on my head and transmitting back to an audience. And the last thing I think I'll show, because I know <laughs> your, your patience has been really beautiful, but um, in the performance, and after this talk, if you all have not seen it, it is archived in the show so you can watch it, but there's some language that starts to play on a, on a very old shoebox recording. And this is the language. It comes from this wonderful book by Dani Laferriere, An Aroma of Coffee, um, L'Odeur du Café in French. And he says, what happens after you die, da, and the name da is, is what he calls his grandmother. Only the ants can answer that. Why don't they tell us? Because death doesn't interest them, old bones. And that's what she calls him, old bones. And why does death interest us? Da took the bag from me, opened it, and spent a long time breathing in the coffee. Courage, daughter. Da closed her eyes. The fire stands between them. What is death, Da? You'll see. Good night, Da. Da says, I am her comfort in her old age. Da says, we're not truly dead until there's no one left on earth to remember our name. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and those were just some snippets that I picked, these kind of cutouts from this wonderful novel by the Haitian artist, Dani Laferriere. And yeah, I think that's it. I can come back to any slides if people are interested, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions, comments, if you want to drop something in the chat. I had one that came up um, for me when you were replaying the um, rolling over the, yeah. the dirt. And I, I was curious if the sonic ocean wave with the dirt was also at play there. So very I much so. The yeah, very much so. I mean, I think that elemental quality and think, but it's also interesting to think about the transformation of dirt into water. Right. Mm -hmm. And then also there, that's such an airy video and we can only imagine that the fire would be the fire sort of of will or spirit within myself. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrea. And if you would like to visually raise your hand or use the, the buttons in the chat, I'll try and watch it all. Can I just ask everyone a question who's here? Like if, if there's one, if you had like one word or phrase that came to mind now that you've heard me kind of go through all these, I'm just curious if you just wanted to drop it in the chat and I just love to see that little bouquet. If there's a word, a phrase or something that just struck you. It's a lot of images. Ooh, retrace, fugue, fuga. Mm. The resurfacing of bloodlines. Yeah, right. It's interesting to think about surface, surfacing, resurfacing, bringing, yeah, bloodlines. I had a question about practice um, when, so I'm thinking as a researcher, when I do my trauma stuff mm -hmm. um, and, and how you have to kind of lift out of this heavy 
like spiritually heavy work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you have go-to exercises or activities for that transition work out of these heavy places. Mm. Well, now I think, I mean, I have really tried to have some things in place, like have a person who, if I like on tap in case I need something and I feel like I'm kind of, I'm sort of altered and haven't come back. I think that's really helpful just to, just to have like a, I see, because when I first started making performance art and you can, when you read and swallow the fish, that thing about performance aftermath, I did not understand that a performance could shift you or that the performance could look like it was over, but it isn't over. And everyone's like wanting to talk to you or maybe even go out with you, whatever. I did not understand. And so it took me a while to realize that maybe I needed to make sure that I had water to drink. It's so, it's very simple. It's very simple, but so often I did not, I was not prepared. I was so like in a, in a tizzy getting everything together to do it that I didn't think about what it would be like after it was over. Sometimes I think, oh, I'm just gonna wanna be by myself and actually I'm lonely and I wanna go out and I wanna eat and like drink cocktails and celebrate. And I think the real thing for me, I've come to realize is that I do not know how I'm going to feel afterwards. I really don't. So it's important then to have 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 some options and to have someone to help me. I think making sure that I have a moment to myself before I talk to anyone can be helpful. Although like in, in Fugue, in none of the Fugues did I have that at all. I mean, because especially if it's some site specific work where you're with people, mm -hmm. but, it, but, it, but in other instances, I've been able to just, just take a breath. That's a very simple practice drink some water, hug yourself, thank yourself. Don't get all tripped up in the stuff you thought you were gonna do that you didn't do or the things that you thought were wrong. Take a moment and be like, thank yourself. Thank your ancestors. Thank the people that allowed you to come and do this work. I mean, those are the kinds of practices I think that help me reckon with work that might seem heavy or traumatic or hard or any kind of work at all. I just think, the, the discharge of energy. I mean, it's, that's the spirit work. That's the seance part of it. And you get, I mean, I remember working with Ellen Marie Hinchcliffe, who was the videographer for the, the piece. She was always really good. Like if we, people were pouring water or we were doing libations or something during a, a kind of performance event, before we did anything, I was like, let's take care of this water. Let's be with this water. Let's thank this water. You know, really you have to close the portal because if you don't, that can be very harmful, but it can take time. You, you might want to close it immediately after you finish doing a thing, but, but it might not be ready to be closed. You might not be ready. The thing might not be over. It's like your nervous system is still vibrating. So you just have to be very gentle with yourself and have support. And another mentor of mine, Omi Oshun Jonielle Jones, she, she always says, be very careful that you don't take yourself someplace that you can't get out of. If you're not ready to get your, if you, are, if you really aren't sure, then maybe now is not the time for you to do a certain kind of work. Thank you, that's so helpful. Any other questions, comments? And again, you can type in the chat and I'm happy to, to read. And I want to lift up those words, signal and change, caring, losing, refinding grief, cycles of grieving. Yeah, those are, those are really powerful, beautiful words. Thank you. Well, I know we covered a lot of your um, upcoming works, but are there specific pieces you want to put on our radars if we kind of start closing the night? Sure. April 3rd. 2021, I'm gonna put it in the chat, in the Salt Lake City Performance Art Festival. I'm gonna do a brand new work that is not even done, that's not even made yet, but I'm thinking about it. It's called Jupiter. I'm thinking about outer space and inner space. Um, and thinking about time and mediation and what's possible in Zoom. 
I'm just curious. I mean, you are you all feeling okay? Yeah, I'm thinking about the four questions you shared about invoking spirits and bloodlines resurfacing. Oh, good question. I was wondering how you think cultural appropriation can affect the significance and importance of these practices, such as connecting with our ancestors. What a powerful and important question. It is so huge because I think there are so many of us that look and can see like American apparel selling or trying to sell our history or something. I mean, and you just think it can put you also in such a defensive stance. It can make you a kind of um, a cultural police officer or something. And, and you want to you want to protect and safeguard and steward what what you've been given in terms of your own cultural resources, but then that work can get in the way of your own process and engagement of your own inheritances. So I think, and even in our communities, the increase in altar making and not knowing if people who are practicing are genuine. I mean, that is a really it's a huge you're you're naming something I think really important, especially because. I mean, I don't know what you think, but I just feel like we're like smack dab in the middle of a, of a dumpster fire in terms of the world and society. And so people are seeking, they are seeking ways, alternate ways, but they don't necessarily have stewardship or guidance to help them. So the notion of like what is genuine or what is not genuine is a big one because there are protocols and practices and ways of doing things. And also, let's see, this is where my Haitian part of me comes in because like Haitian Vudun, uh, there are definitely protocols and practices, but it is very adaptable. And I remember asking my father, I was like, okay, well, let's say you're supposed to be drawing this, this symbol on the ground, but you don't have any chalk. And he was like, well, do it with cornmeal. And I was like, well, what if you don't have cornmeal? He's like, well, do it with a chicken feather. Well, what if you don't have a heap? What if you don't have a chicken? Well, do it with your hand in the air. I mean, he's saying that this kind of there's a certain kind of precision or authenticity that's actually a product of a kind of perfectionism that's related to white supremacy, okay? Or Western thinking. So that's, that's one thing, but that's actually not what you're asking about. I'm just saying that because I'm like deeply noticing that sometimes people are getting into it about things that in the deep manifestation of spirit actually are not the most important things. But there is a problem of like figuring out how do you know how do you know what your territory is? How do you ask permission? And then also, how do you signal to other people that you have asked permission? Because there's also uh, often an idea that people come to you and they think, well, why are you doing, you don't have a right, but, you, but they might not know. You might not know what process someone else has actually gone through. And there can be a very knee jerk reaction. And I think for me, um, I think that there's something around slowing it all down, trying to ask questions, ask for guidance, connect with people. It's hard because we're in a moment right now where people are tired and there's not always as much generosity. I feel very lucky. People were very generous with me, okay? And also when I was becoming a performance artist, I had to like hang out and witness and roll with a bunch of people who did not always treat me that well or did not, I, how can I put it at least on, on, our, on an aesthetic level? I mean, and I remember trying to chase these experimental, these like white experimental dancers in the Twin Cities who did not even like, I don't know. I just don't think that they registered that I was even there, okay? That's different from cultural appropriation in a, in, a, in a kind of racial ethnic sense, but there's something where there was a particular culture that they just didn't think I had anything to do with. They didn't think that I, you know, why, why that, that didn't belong to me or it didn't occur to them that there would be some connection there for me. And they were not always very nice. I would say, I mean, I, I'm sure those people now, many of them, I know them, they probably, they're like, what are you even talking about? They don't need, I just didn't register at all. But I showed up for it because I felt that there was some, there was a calling there. There was a, something was calling me for real, okay? So there are other, so what do you do when there are, what do you do when you're called into something that isn't actually supposedly authentic to you? So I guess what I'm doing right now is that often, this is a question I feel like people of color talk to each other about when they're, when they're looking at people outside of their communities 
kind of like putting their hand in the cookie jar and you're like, hey, 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 what are you doing over there? Okay, so that's one part of it. But I also, I want to acknowledge and honor that like I'm a bicultural person. I'm a person that's traveled all around. And like, I have to also reckon with that for myself. I have to reckon with the idea as an artist that I am not hyper invested in essentialism. I'm definitely interested in invoking and honoring my own ancestors, but I don't want to be only only confined to a story about what my own kind of, um, what my own spirits are, okay? So like, I feel like I wanna be able to claim Ana Mendieta as an ancestor for me and honor her, even though we don't share, we don't necessarily share the same racial and ethnic bloodline, but we share another kind of bloodline, which is an ancestral artistic bloodline, you know? So, that, so I guess what I wanna do I wanna slow down and have more conversation and like deeply engage and complicate some of the questions and also think about our own possibilities and also our own frailties and places where we need to be schooled too. I mean, so, you know what I mean? I think I wanna, I wanna open it up. I hope, have I answered your question? Thank you. <laughs> And Julia, I see your hand. Do you want to share? Yes, it's uh, <clears throat> very much connected to what you, you were saying. Something that echoed with me was um, your performance on on the Nigerian girls. And I was wondering, like, yeah, it just echoed because of, you know, thinking about Colombia and always trying to navigate this line of speaking about the history of violence in my country, but also not speaking about it and what are the implications of both? Mm. Um, mm. Especially like, because like my personal experience was very much in the fringes of what other people lived through. So I was wondering what your process was and how you negotiated that. Um, I kind of, I think it's curious to use this word appropriation because I guess it can be defined in other ways but you know the root you immediately think of property and like what is what is this mm -hmm. thing what is this idea of thinking of culture as property like is it property is it something that goes deeper anyway I'm like <laughs> um, diverging there but yeah, what was your process of like negotiating this? Because I think it's really important to feel uncomfortable, right? Like not always um, writing or performing from the same the same place that you know very well, but like negotiating it not being your sort of personal or direct um, experience, but something that really spoke to you and how, yeah, how that process worked for you in that piece or in other pieces that you felt that? Well, thank you for that question. And also it is interesting to think about cultures as property um, because I do think that's a very, that comes in the United States, at least I believe from the fact that everything has been so commodified and so that our, some of our most important cultural practices have been turned into money for other people. And so there's like a, there's something around that, like the need to stop that, from, you know what I mean? Like it's really about that, but our, I do have a feeling that our ancestors, at least I know in the Haitian context, I mean, it's Haitian Vodun is so syncretic. They, I mean, they pulled from everything. I mean, and you know, and so, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that that's an interesting thing that I'm thinking about as well. In terms of the process for Say My Name and Action for 270 Abducted Nigerian Girls, that was a very intense work because I made it maybe the first iteration of it that I ever did was maybe like a week after it was announced that they were, that they were, um, they had been abducted. And for me, it was about raising consciousness and also honestly, now this is around spirit work and this is around my own kind of beliefs, feeling like if I could say their name, if we could be in a room and try to vibrate and raise the energy around it, maybe we could get these girls back. So it was less, I mean, it was definitely still within an artistic practice or context for me. I mean, I definitely still was thinking around composition, image, action, concept, like all these different things that I'm, I'm interested in. But I was also so appalled that this happened. And 
I was just like, this is a crisis and an emergency. And this felt like a, it felt oh, it was so interesting because it felt both like all I could do and also like an exercise in futility because calling these names, what was that actually gonna do? Was that gonna bring them back? No, but I mean, what else could I do if I'm an artist? This is what I'm supposed to be doing. you know. So I think the process on the one hand was very immediate and it just felt like I, I happened to be at that time <laughs> this was a wonderful, see, I have like too much stuff, y'all. We could talk all night because I did a, I co-curated an, an event called Girls in Their Bedrooms. And it just so happened that that event was right after, I mean, I, we didn't, I mean, it was this celebration of what is like the, what is the kind of creative work you do in your intimate space, whether or not you're a girl, you know what I mean? But like, what is the intimate space and what happens like in your dream space? And why is it that there are so many people who are identified as girls or who identify themselves as girls who are not safe in those spaces? Like, what is that? And so we just created, it was a whole, like there were installations. We invited some people in our community. It was a house show. There ended up being a special issue of Asterix about it. And the very first iteration of Say My Name happened there. And it was an installation and people were very um, upset. Okay, I mean, because it was, we were all like upset that this thing was happening and trying to hold the, hold it all at the same time that we were joyful to be together and we were lifting up a kind of creativity and Maya Angelou had just become an ancestor and then you had these girls had just been taken and then we were, I mean, the, I, it just was, it was so many things all at the same time. When I came in 2014 to do it at the Call and Response uh, festival, which which led to Experiments in Joy. That was the first iteration of the Experiments in Joy symposium. That I was more, all of a sudden, more time had passed. The girls still were not back. It felt like things were, were fading. I was in a predominantly sort of white environment. And I was just like, I want these people to have to hold the weight of this the way that I am holding it. So I had a different energy there. I was just like, okay. And I'm gonna ha I'm, and I'm gonna make them have to negotiate how what what they should do or if they can't do anything what that feels like but have to think about it at least for the amount of time of this performance and it was so painful every time I do that it is so painful because to take a piece of paper with this girl's name I'm sorry I'm losing light here to take a piece of paper with this girl's name and drop it on the floor like that Gabrielle not in the realm of performance just me myself would never do that. I mean, I would never, never do that. Except that was me who's doing that because in that, I felt like all of a sudden I was the medium in the seance. I was, I was performing this kind of sacred function. It was a thing that I had to do to activate something in that space. And even if it didn't feel good for me, it wasn't about me. Even if it seemed like it was all about me because it was my piece and I was making it happen or whatever. Um, it was this thing I was doing that I knew was not enough. And that was part of what it was to do it and to make everyone also be in the in the quiet and the in the quandary of it. That's the in-betweenness. You know, that was what it was. And so in Cre and then wanting to do it again and also wanting to understand why do people, why do people move or not move and what does movement look like? If someone sits while I'm doing that and doesn't do anything with me or try to stop me, does it mean they're not doing anything? There are some people who are praying. You know what I mean? You just, it just, it was, became an exercise in paying attention and listening, watching. It's really, it's been a really, I need to write about that piece because a lot of things happened. I was, I remember once in Ohio, there was another Haitian person in the crowd and he just, he walked up, he took those papers out of my hand. He said, you must stop this. It just, his whole body vibrated with what I was doing. And, and I always time it. And while he held it, we, I just stood there and he held it and, we, and we, I waited until the clock wound down. We just had to be in that moment together and everyone just had to watch us. And he just would not let me take them. I mean, I didn't try to snatch them back, but I just, he took them. And he just, it was clear that he was, it was like he was, ga he was taking them back to him, right? And then there's a whole process. What do I do with those papers after it's over? That's a whole other issue because you don't take work like that and throw it in the trash or put it in the recycling bin. Like that's not what you do. So, so it's part of the process, Julia, is, um, whew, it's just 
being so clear of your own intention that even if there are others who could object or who could feel uncomfortable or angry with you, that you are clear about what you were trying to do. I think that that really matters um, because things can become very <laughs> adversarial. No one has ever challenged me with this, but I did my friend Warren Natasha Ogunji, she redid the piece in, Ni in Lagos, Nigeria with people in her community. And that was an interesting thing that she talked about and that they felt some shame that some African-American girl had done something about you know, um, something that happened in their country. It just, I mean, there were so many different layers of it. So anyway, that's a little bit about my process. Great, thank you. Thanks, Julia. I have a question about, it's like half formed, but um, it, it came to me when you're uh, touching on the Dred Scott piece mm -hmm. and, it, and, and today just in general, you're weaving in to other people's works and um, especially in Swallow the Fish, but I think in a lot of your writing, there is this like layering and weaving work. And I kind of read it as like a trans historical layering. Mm -hmm. And I'm always so curious when I go and I look at the original text it, where you, you've snippeted a portion. Mm -hmm. And I like to think about what's layered with your text above their own and, and after. And I'm curious if you could chat about like why you do this particular type of imbrication and what it mm. means to you and all of that good stuff. Well, that is really connected to my background as a poet. And so I was originally trained as a poet and then moved into performance art as a way to try to move language differently. So it's like moving, coming to performance art as another kind of way to make poems and to make a different kind of poem that was inflected by the body, moving from a figure of speech into the figure of the body. I think that that's a big part of my trajectory. And so in that practice, I've been very influenced by like surrealist literary techniques, specifically the cut up. And so if you, in Swallow the Fish, when you read, um, uh, is it Berlitz? has cut ups in it. Um, and then the infamous, like after hieroglyphic, you know, and the, where I'm cutting up racist jokes and romance novels. I'm just really interested in what happens when you take language, kind of defamiliarize it, shift it, layer it, collage it. It also, uh, it kind of lets me off the hook of having to start from a blank page as well. So it's sort of like, well, what are, the, what are the sources? What are the resources? What's informing what's going on? And then it is me who still is doing the weaving, who's doing the imbricating. And then that is a kind of layering. I mean, the first performances that I did, if I think about, you see, that's a lot of that stuff. And that's why the fish, when I think about infestation of gnats and then having like friends voiceovers of Lucille Clifton's poem, like, you know, last night we killed all the roaches, mama and me, and it was murder, murder, murder all over the place. And having that layer over me doing a piece about the bombing of Afghanistan, you know, nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. But I mean, for me, it was about the kind of personal mythology and the way that different kinds of language was layering and that all of that language was layering over my body and action. And it was sort of creating these sort of understories or something. I remember I had that, I had Rumi, there was some Emily Dickinson thing, plus it was my own language. Um, Infestation of Nats is one of, my, one of my favorite things actually that I myself have written, but that, but that when I was in the act of performing, it didn't feel like, I mean, maybe that was also insecurity perhaps, but it didn't feel like it was enough. Felt like it was one voice, but it was a voice that was, that was in relationship to these other kinds of voices that had helped to produce it. Um, and then later, what, that became less literal so that it was less about these different, um, although there's still voice, I'm interested in voiceover. And I think that collage can become a kind of voiceover, right? Mm -hmm. But it started to also be around kind of visual so that the, if you think about the projection of that video and that performance, that's a kind of imbrication, that's a layering, right? And that, that is something around the transhistorical, I would say too, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much. I think I just found the YouTube clip to drop in the chat for you if there are people who wanna see that, if, I, if this will be 
nice to me, which I don't know if it will. Let's see what's going on here. Here we go. I just found it. I can put it in the chat for you. Ah, it's very loud. Yeah. Any anything else? Do you all feel like at the time I had a thought like it could be interactive, but I feel like you all I can I'm looking and I'm seeing like wheels turning. I'm seeing seeing maybe hands. So I don't know if people just kind of want to reflect on their own or if they want to have a have a little like breakout room moment. Just two minutes in a breakout room. I don't know. A little. How do breakout we feel yay nay? How are y'all feeling? Are you wanna, or do you wanna like go eat your dinner? I was gonna say maybe our our East Coast time. <laughs> yeah, I know it's only five. See, it's like five thirteen for me, so I'm in a different dynamic. You see, the sun hasn't even set yet, actually. Although in the other room, it's getting there. But shall we call it a day? Anyone else have anything else they want to say? Cool. I just have one question. Um, Thank you so much for your presentation. It was amazing. Um, yes. Yeah, I was just think as you were uh, speaking just now, I was thinking about um, just like embodiments of uh, citation and citationality, like thinking about when you were talking about kind of influence influences as ancestors. I think I'm think I think a lot about like the action of cite citing as a scholar and like also as a poet, like thinking about poetry as well as kind of like this intentional practice of citing like influences through the work. And I'm wondering if that's kind of um, part of your process in terms of like your figuring of seance and figurings of fugue. Cause I think about the musical fugue a lot and how like music is constantly aware of itself of its influences. Um, and it's also, if it's not aware of itself it's the responsibility of the listener to kind of listen for those um, influences as well. So, cause some artists are not even aware of it. They're like, yeah, I guess I was influenced by this person. Um, but it wasn't like, maybe it wasn't in the mind as you were making it, but it was like subconsciously there. And sometimes it's brought to your attention. So it's like this mix of intention, but also kind of sitting with the works or like being like a dwelling that you don't know it has an effect on you until it's actually been created. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway, I just wanted to know what you thought about um, citation and your work. That makes complete sense to me. I feel like you can be steeped in something and not even register it until you're like making something and you realize the impact on it. That's one thing. I think that embodied citation is huge. I feel like the work that I've done in the last few years, especially in the realm of dance and kind of downtown improvisational dance, I mean, the way that you pick, I mean, I'm terrible at following choreography, but I, I do notice, I mean, and this is even if I go to a club, which I hope I will be able to in 2021 or 2022, but anyway, you know, just like all of a sudden you look at someone in their movement and you're bringing that into your body or it's like a response. Right. And so when I, and that's another thing when I think about something like appropriation and how art actually happens, it gets it does get murky because you 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 absorb. But that I mean you absorb, but that doesn't mean that you should unethically steal, right? So how do you balance those things? But you're talking about a way of bringing in your influences and acknowledging that. And in some level, there's like a little micro hip hop part of me that loves how people shout out their peers. They shout out people who came before. They weave in references to songs and lyrics and things that are letting you know who they've been listening to and are letting you know that they know that they have been influenced by certain people. That's a kind of embodied citation that's happening in music that's really interesting to me. And I think even these voiceovers that I was doing with these poems earlier, or even, I mean, even bringing in the slides of these artists that I love, that's a kind of embodied citation. And that's a reminder to myself and like a, an honoring of these people, but also letting you know that I know that these people have, have influenced what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So there's something around that that's important. I wanna think about it more too, because I just think there, there are so many amazing lost people or not lost, but people who have not been hyped the way that they should be. And I feel like there has to be some space for that. I mean, I think Jamila Wood 
did that that album and then every track well no but still they have a song called Basquiat but like Basquiat's name is never in the song it's just like I'm calling it this because I want you to know who this person is that's a kind of embodied citation I just love that's constellating that's creating and acknowledging artistic and lineages and and also recognizing and appreciating literal and chosen bloodlines. I think that work can be so nourishing and powerful. And so thank you for asking about that because I feel like I want to continue to explore that in my own work too, even more. Awesome. And Julia Rose Sutherland, thank you. I really, I still am thinking about your talk and it was so great to have had a chance to attend it. So, and it's recorded. So if people missed Julia's talk, go, go watch it because it was great. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Mark. I mean, all of the events are up online um, and this one will be added, you know, early next week. So um, we've got all of the artworks as well. You can watch Fugue, like Gabrielle mentioned. Uh, and then there's a catalog. Check it out, read it. Tell me what you think. I haven't heard much feedback yet. So I'm so curious um, how people like some of the writing. Um, any other final thoughts, questions, comments? If anyone wants to be on my mailing list, just drop your email address into the chat. We just dropped um, <laughs> civilities number 15, just, just hit yesterday, but we can send it to you. <laughs> They're always so such a pleasure because um, you're always doing so many different things. So it's just such a, a nice like monthly uh pep talk it, it's like invigorating i think every time it comes i'm glad to hear it. i think sometimes people are like that gabrielle seville who does she think she is a prom queen you know like i think it's just like why is she telling us all but i'm like you know what i'm just gonna let you know if you're interested <laughs> check it out you know so it's kind of in that energy but thank you again so much jess i really have appreciated the chance to share a little bit about my work absolutely thank you all right, everyone, take care, be well, um, check everything out, uh, email me if you have questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming to the final event and closing out the exhibition. Woo!